Good evening to everyone. Uh, peace and blessings. Uh, may this be a beneficial evening for us and time well spent together. Uh, I'd like to start first of all by summarizing what I said uh, for the benefit of those not familiar with those expressions, basically uh, praising God and invoking prayers for peace and blessings upon uh, who we believe as Muslims to be the final messenger of God sent to humanity. <clears throat> After a long line of prophets and messengers that include names that most of you are probably familiar with, Noah, Moses, Abraham, David, uh, Jesus, and we believe culminating with the Prophet of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon him. And uh, now I'd like to first of all thank uh, the university here and uh, thank uh, Dr. Dunn uh, for his uh, leadership of this fine institution for uh, opening its doors to be a welcoming environment, a welcoming campus where Muslims feel very, very comfortable and uh, the proof of that, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. They have almost tripled their quota of Saudi Arabian students because they feel so comfortable. They say, oh, you have to come to Western Michigan, even though they've exceeded their quota. So it's a, it's a very uh, uh, fitting uh, occasion, if you will, that we are gathered here at, at such a welcoming university. Uh, also, I'd like to thank all of the Muslim students who worked so hard to organize this event uh, and sacrifice their time, their study time, uh, their leisure time to expend energy, time, even money uh, out of pocket because being a former MSA uh, organizer. There are a lot of things that the money one might get from the university just doesn't cover, especially the last minute unbudgeted expenses, the run to Kinko's for more flyers, or they've run here for this, that, or the other. So they've spent time, they've spent energy, and they've even spent money, I'm sure. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's very fitting that we thank and welcome all of the people from member, all the members of other faith communities who have come here at such a critical, intense time in the history of this nation. Because your presence here, and especially your presence in such large numbers, indicates that there is a fundamental goodness within your hearts that is pushing you towards trying to understand what's going on, uh, to learn a little bit about Islam from a Muslim and not from someone who might have a very antithetical attitude or position vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. So this is a testimony to your open-mindedness, your uh, fundamental goodness, and this is the spirit that's going, I believe, that's going to move this country forward so that it can truly uh, be uh, in the world a, a beacon and a source of hope for all people, not just some people. So not denying that the country is a source of hope for some people, it certainly is, but I believe there's potential 
for it to be a source of hope for all people. And working together, I think we can make that happen. As you gather, uh, most of you are students or teachers. All of you are intelligent people. Looking at the title tonight, uh, you can see that's a very tall order. And I don't think I can fill that order in 45 minutes. It's now been reduced to 35 due to the length of the introduction. So I can only <laughs> give you some insight into these matters and to focus on one. And that one particular one is the fundamental uh, uh, unity of humanity if you will, and the ties that bind us together and then touch on the issue of uh, class and gender. <clears throat> I'd like to start with one of the verses that uh, Hafiz Nuraman uh, so eloquently recited and that's from Surah, a chapter in the Quran called Al-Hujarat, the inner apartments, the 49th chapter in the Quran. So we read there, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shuruban wa qaba'ila li ta'arufu, inna akramakum inna allahi ataqaakum, inna allaha alimun khabir. So a rough translation of that would be, Oh, humankind, we've created you from a single pair, a male and a female. And we've made you into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other. And parenthetically, it's usually mentioned, not that you may despise each other. Surely the best or most noble of you with God is the one most conscious, conscious of his commandments and prohibitions. Verily, God is all-knowing, well-informed. So if we consider this verse, it reminds us of a fact that's been scientifically proven. And that is, we all emanate from a single pair. Many of us refer to that single pair, that original pair is Adam and Eve. And in Arabic we say Adam and Hawa. Some might say prototypical couple 97.1. Or some might call it uh, hum, human 1.0. Now we're in version 900, who knows what. But whatever you refer to through genetic mapping and tracing back our common lineages through genetic markers, and some of you saw a National Geographic special around this issue, uh, scientists have traced us back to a common pair, which means two things. Number one, there is something from that original set of parents in all of us. There's genetic material that's been handed down generation after generation that is in all of us. And secondly, we're all brothers and sisters at the end of the day. Cousins at the very least. We're all related. We're all related. And that being the case, there's no such thing as an Aryan Superman. And there's no such thing as a supreme Asiatic black man, which various forms and various stripes of racial thinking, racialized thinking, allege that there's some racial superiority. Uh, as Muslims, we believe that racism is a satanic phenomenon is something whose origins is rooted in Satan. That is satanic. And it's unacceptable. Why do we say it's satanic? There's a verse in the Quran, there's a story that's repeated more than once. So Satan is asked by his Lord, by Almighty God, why didn't you prostrate yourself to Adam? Why didn't you acknowledge his vicegerency over this creation when I appointed him as my vicegerent. 
And Satan said, I'm better than him. Says, yeah, uh, He said, I'm better than him. Why should I prostrate to him when I'm better? You created me from fire while you created him from clay. So why should I prostrate myself to mud man? He's made out of mud. And I'm made out of fire. And the nature of fire is that it rises. Therefore, I have a potential for elevation. And mud flows downhill. That's why you have mudslides. He's welded to the ground. So in essence, he's arguing my physical composition makes me better. He didn't make a moral argument. I, I shouldn't prostrate to him because I never told a lie. And he flipped about the cherry tree. The chronology's mixed up here, I know. <laughs> but I never told a lie, I'm better. I eat my spinach, and he doesn't. He's not making a moral argument, he's making an argument that's strictly confined to the physical difference between him and Adam. You made me from fire, and you made him from clay. So we believe every racist who said, I'm better because of this physical characteristic. My skin is white, my skin is black, my skin is brown, I'm tall, those people are short. We have uh, narrow lips, those people have plump, juicy lips, we, whatever. <laughs> Any difference that's rooted in differences in physical composition, we believe, is satanic. And it's unacceptable. Now, in this, so the verse, it starts, on oh, humanity, humankind, we made you from a single pair, a male and female. It's telling us you're all in this together. You're all united. Even physically united. You're united. And we've made you into nations and tribes. So our subsequent divisions into nations and tribes, there's nothing wrong with that. There is a purpose in it, in order that you recognize in each other. And our exegetes, they explain what are we to recognize when we see each other. To recognize the creative power of God. So we should be an encouragement to each other to glorify our Creator, who from that single pair can bring about all of this diversity. All of this diversity from a single pair all of the various skin tones, and they're all beautiful. All of the various features, and they're all beautiful. All the various hair textures, and they're all beautiful, and they serve their purposes in the various climes that people find themselves in. Various uh, eye structures and whatever. It's all beautiful. And when we see that in each other, we can recognize the creative power of our Lord, who can bring about all of this diversity out from a single prayer, from a single pair. And not that we may despise one another, not that we may use these differences for claims of superiority, not that we may use these differences for, for to arrogate ourselves over each other, or to feel that some of us have an advantage over the others, some of us are privileged in certain ways. No. <laughs> So, who is more virtuous in reality? The most noble of you, the best of you, is the one who is most conscious in his or her relationship with their Creator. So, this is a quality that has no physical appearance. Many of our scholars, Muslim scholars, when they come in on this verse, they bring a prophetic tradition. And that tradition states in the Allah, لا ينظر إلى سواركم وأموالكم ولكن ينظر إلى قلوبكم وعمالكم That God doesn't look at your physical features. Suarikum. Nor does your physical forms. Nor does He look at your wealth. So these are two of the greatest basis for discrimination and inequality 
amongst ourselves, racial and ethnic differences and economic differences. But we're told God doesn't look at your physical forms, nor does he consider your wealth. Rather, he looks at your hearts and your deeds. He looks at your hearts and your deeds. The best of you are those who are the strongest moral fiber. The best of you are those who are best in their deeds, in their service to their fellow humans, in their stewardship of the earth, in their compassion for the poor and the downtrodden. That's who the best of you is. And not the ones who are the this color or that color or this shape or that shape or in this economic class or that economic class. The best of you are those who are best in deed. The best of you are those who are best in the purity and the moral substance and fiber of their hearts. So this verse is telling us or presenting us with these messages that we should not look at each other as uh, divisible categories of people. We should see ourselves as one indivisible collectivity. And it's telling us there are natural differences, there are tribal differences and racial differences and ethnic differences, but these should not negate the common bonds that unite us. These are beautiful things. And the diversity is what, as they say, diversity is the spice of life. And when we travel to other lands, at least there was a time, I don't know about now, when we look forward to going to South Asia to have some nice spicy samosas and some biryani. And we're disappointed if we travel all the way to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka and the only fare available is Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Man, I could have stayed in America for this. Variety is the spice of life. And we should cherish the variety that exists uh, between and amongst us. We should cherish the various ways of dressing. We should cherish the various cuisines that people have developed over the course of centuries in some cases. We should cherish the various uh, geograph the uh, various uh, arrangements of our cities and the nature, the way our parks are structured, the way public space is organized, and all of the differences that the way our houses of worship are 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 manifested. And Muslims have always respected that until very recent history that diversity. And that's why you see Muslims in South Asia dressing one way. Muslims in the Far East, in Malaysia, or the Southern Philippines, dressing another way. And building their masjids, their mosques, with a distinctly Far Eastern flavor. The, uh, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the St. Basil's Basilica in the Kremlin, in the heart of Moscow, very Russian, the big onion domes. How many of you are familiar with that? The very colorful domes. You've seen pictures of it. That building is a Polish Tartar mosque. When Ivan the Terrible went into Poland, he destroyed all of the Tartar Polish, their indigenous Polish Muslims. He destroyed all of their mosques except one. It was so beautiful that he ordered it to be dismantled brick by brick. He brought it to Moscow and had it reconstructed. That's what that building is. The point is, it's very, very Polish. Very Russian. It's very Eastern European because the Muslims respected those cultural differences and didn't try to annihilate them. They sought to blend them and merge them with Islamic themes and motifs and principles. And that brought about tremendous diversity. You see African Muslims in their mosques. The largest adobe structure on earth is the great, great mosque at Jinni in Mali. Built from mud. I was there earlier this spring. Mud 
naturally air conditioned, perfect for the climate. That's the type of diversity that is uh, exemplified, lita'arufu. Lita'arufu, that you know one another and recognize your differences and don't despise one another. Now, saying that, to move on to class equality, Islam is not a leveling idea. So it's not an idea that advocates the kind of things that Marxist ideology advocates, creating a classless society with no class differential differentiation between us, <clears throat> because that is an unnatural idea. You find uh, you don't find uh, perfect equality in nature. If there is no positive charge and a negative charge, you can't generate electricity. If there's no male and female and the union between the two, you can't perpetuate humanity. If everyone's just one androgynous mass of totally equal human beings in every aspect, certainly there are areas where there are rights and that are that are uh, should be distributed equally in society. But the idea of total equality in all affairs, in all matters, uh, isn't an Islamic idea, and certainly not economically. But what is, uh, so one of the great, and it doesn't work. Every communistic society has collapsed, generally because people didn't have an incentive to exert themselves. Why should I exert myself if there's any surplus, my family doesn't benefit from it, it's going to be taken from me and given to those people over there who don't want to work because they know they're going to get theirs anyway. And not that that's a gross simplification, but that's one of the reasons communism generally has not worked. And there are, there are good features of communist societies, uh, which shouldn't be denied, but there are also some very bad features, and that's one of them. So, one of the maqasid of Islam, one of the great objectives is the preservation of private property. To give people an, an incentive to work. But, there, is also, there are also teachings that guarantee those who are structurally denied access to work. They want to work. And so in this country, and in, in this state specifically, in Michigan, which was a harbinger of things to come economically in this country, there are a lot of people who want to work. There are a lot of highly skilled people, but their factories are being closed. And structurally, they're being denied the right to work. Structurally, meaning their jobs have been sent to another country. The structure of our globalized economy has marginalized them and deprive them of avenues where they can exp uh, they can uh, engage in the professions they've been highly trained and they're highly skilled and qualified to perform. This is what I'm talking about. People in those situations, there should be a safety net in society. People who want to work but are unable to work. People who might, because of some physical uh, misfortune that's afflicted them, are unable to work. There should be a safety net, so just as private property is preserved, so one of the great overarching objectives of Islamic law is the preservation of religion itself, din, the preservation of life, the preservation of the intellect, and that's why intoxicants are forbidden, the preservation of the family, and the preservation of private property, hirfun man. So, but, and there are substantiations of these principles from Quran and tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of God's messengers. But, there are also teachings with the amwalihim hakkum ma'alum nisa'ili wa nahrum. And in their wealth, there is a well defined right. For those who are forced into circumstances where they have to ask for assistance and for those who are deprived the right to work or for some other reason. 
So there is a balance. There is not perfect equality. There is not a classless society that's being advocated. But compassion and empathy is being urged and if a person who has excess means doesn't pay uh, the equivalent of the tithes that Christians pay, then the state has the right to take that percentage of their wealth because once it's, uh, it's due to be paid, it is no longer their wealth, it's the property of the poor people. And the state has the right to take it and give it to the poor people, to distribute it amongst the poor people. So Islam advocates a system that blends features of capitalism and features of socialism in a unique system that recognizes class differentiations, recognizes a right to private property, recognizes a right to the fruit of one's labor and toil, but also recognizes the right of the poor, oppressed, and downtrodden people in a society. And this is also mentioned in the zakat, the obligatory poor tax that every Muslim of means and wealth has to pay. In the in the masadaqat, the fuqara, the masakin, the amilin alayha, the muallafti qulubuhum, etc. That the uh, poor do is for the poor and the downtrodden. So the fuqara and the masakin which indicates that there are some people who are poor, who are the recipients of this money, and there are some people who are, who are wealthy, who have to pay it. Now, how much is it? It's two and a half percent. Two and a half percent. Which isn't oppressing anyone. If you're wealthy, to pay two and a half percent of your wealth for the poor people is not particularly taxing for anyone. But if everyone paid it, just think of the tremendous amounts of wealth that will be available for those who are poor and deprived. If you just start doing the math, you can see that there will be a tremendous pool of wealth and resources for those people. So again, there's a balance that's being advocated. And we believe everything in this creation has been established on the basis of a balance. So, well, that God created the heavens and earth, and then He established the balance. Allah fil mizan, and don't the, and, all, and He's established this balance, and He's warned you that you don't disrupt this balance. So, there's a balance in society. There's a balance in gender relations. There's a balance in class relations. There's a balance in the various ecosystems that have been established. And our challenge as human beings is not to disrupt, disrupt the balance that has been established by God. Oftentimes we disrupt it, think we're doing good, and great harm results. And many of you could readily think of many examples of that. The same pertains in gender relations. In gender relations, there are different roles and responsibilities for men and women. And collectively they establish a balance between the man and the woman, which allows healthy social life to exist. When we, and this is uh, my interpretation, as I've been taught, of Islamic teachings in this regard. So I'm not saying all Muslims feel this way. I think a fair number do, but I'm not going to uh, overgeneralize over uh, that the man and woman exist in the context of a relationship. And that relationship is predicated on a differentiation of roles and responsibilities. Now this is separate from a discussion of rights. They're equal before God. Their deeds are rewarded equally. Their religious responsibilities is there in terms of prayer and fasting are rewarded equally. And if there, if there are any divine punishments to be ascribed, they're equally uh, proscribed for men and women. So there's no punishment for a, a woman who's engaged in some sexual indiscretion and the man just walks away. 
So periodically there is some controversy in the paper along those lines. There has no basis in Islamic teachings. But socially, there are roles and there are, there's a differentiation between those roles and that differentiation allows for our society to function. If everyone's doing the same thing and everyone assumes the same roles and everyone assumes the same rights and responsibilities equally across the board and that differentiation is lost, then we believe that balance will be upset. And when that balance is upset, there will be social turmoil and social chaos. So, equality before the law, yes. Equality before God, yes. But exact equality in terms of social roles and responsibilities, no. Historically, like most traditional societies, including this country, until recent times, the last few decades, generally a woman's role or function uh, or constructed around her domestic responsibilities and duties. Not meaning women weren't to be educated. Islamic history until very recent history, uh, uh, recent times rather, you see uh, an unbroken chain of highly educated women. There were even women who wrote their husband's books and edited their husband's books and their husbands became famous and only students who look deeply into these matters know the reality of the situation. One of these was the great Hanafi scholar Imam al who was the author of one of the great books in uh, Islamic law, a great compendium, the Da'is Sanaya, a very great book. It's, it's understood his wife edited the book and assisted him. There was uh, uh, the great teachers at one time in uh, Islamic Spain, Al Andalus. There were 5,000 women alive at one time who had memorized the entire Sahih Bukhari, the entire compendium of prophetic tradition of Sahih Bukhari, considered the most authentic book in prophetic tradition. 5,000 women had memorized that book. So education was encouraged, even though the woman's role was consistent with the traditional role of most women in most societies. It's more domestic role, but it was understood the women are going to be the first teachers of the children. Therefore, if you keep your women ignorant, you're going to have ignorant children. And if you have ignorant children, eventually you're going to have an ignorant and weak society. So the domestic role was not an excuse to keep women ignorant. And even to this day, in Oman, one of the Gulf states, is very common practice for women to learn the Qur'an and then they are the first teachers of their male and female children of the Qur'an. So the idea that a primarily domestic role negates uh, education is, is a false dichotomy that has never, the world historically hasn't existed until very recent times. Exceptional women have always uh, had an impact on society. So you see great teachers, great thinkers, great educators, even great political figures throughout the history of Islam. And there are even encyclopedias of great influential Muslim women. As I said, until very recent times when colonization disrupted the natural harmony and balance of Muslim societies. And one way that it did that, in addition to internal decay, so we're not saying, oh, colonization is responsible for every woe in the Muslim world, but it did accelerate certain developments. The colonizing armies generally who came were men. And they were coming from Europe at a time when there was no such thing as women's liberation in Europe. So they were coming to Muslim societies and elsewhere, such as Latin America, Central America, the Caribbean, and uh, various uh, non-Muslim parts of Africa and the Muslim world. And they were bringing extremely patriarchal attitudes on the one hand, and they were bringing 
male domination, because generally conquering armies don't travel with large numbers of women. So men were in charge, and one of the phenomena that Ibn Khaldun, who's considered one of the first uh, sociologists in the modern sense of the word noted, is that conquered people generally imitate their conquerors. And so Muslims tended to imitate the ways and take on and adopt the attitudes of the conquering armies. And those attitudes were extremely patriarchal during that period of time, during the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, as Europeans went out and then conquered large swaths of the world. And those attitudes, you can see as they are adopted and become institutionalized in Muslim society, you see an end of traditions of great Muslim women scholars. You see an end of Muslim women being involved in some areas where they were involved in political affairs. You see this coming to an end. So this is one thing. The bottom line, there is a balance. And we believe that balance has to be respected, that it doesn't necessarily in everything uh, mean a, a replication of roles, but a differentiation of roles, and that that is conducive to a sound and healthy society. In conclusion, I must say that as Muslims we're challenged. We're challenged in this country and we're challenged globally. We're challenged to make a greater effort, a far greater effort, to bring the teachings of our religion to bear in our everyday life, in our institutions, and in our societies. So that they can be an example for people. So that they might be serve as an alternative for people that are seeking a credible alternative. But if we talk about the common bond that Islam encourages us to recognize in each other. If we talk about how uh, these nations and tribes are to recognize each other, but in our mosques, in our councils, in our homes, we have racist attitudes. How, who is there to translate those teachings into a viable example to help provide people with an alternative? I'll give you one small example. In most of our Muslim cultures, when uh, girls who are, are lighter complexion get married far faster than girls of darker complexion, even if the, the girl whose complexion is darker looks like Miss Universe, and the girl who has a lighter complexion look, looks like Mike Tyson's punching bag, <laughs> when people were naming their pit bulls Tyson. So when Tyson was Tyson, and not this confused person, he is now. When people were naming their pit bulls and walking with the dog, what's your dog's name? Tyson. Oh, man. Ooh. So, if that kind of nonsense is present in our homes, if those kind of attitudes are present, are present in our mosques, in our societies, then how can we serve as an embodiment of kuntum khayra ummatul ukhrijat nas? You're the best people raised up for the benefit of humanity. So we have to take these teachings, and we're ta challenged to take these teachings and to translate them into positive action that impacts on our individual on our families, on our communal life, our family life, our individual life, and on our societal lives. And when we do that, when we do that, we will have the credibility necessary to begin to make the lofty claims for our religion that we make. And unless and until we do that, for a lot of people, much of what we say will ring hollow. So brothers and sisters, we're challenged. People were challenged. In this country, we're challenged. We have an opportunity in these times of economic uncertainty, in these times where
where it's very easy for demagogues to exploit the insecurities that people are feeling and to encourage uh, racial segregation, to encourage, encourage a turn, return to past decades that this country has transcended. We are challenged to keep moving forward. We're challenged to keep working together to try to create the kind of society for where everyone will feel welcome, where everyone feels that they have a part to play, and to, to make the necessary sacrifices to provide that safety net for so many people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves facing very, very, very difficult economic circumstances. So collectively, if we can come together as we've come together this evening, if we can put our hearts and minds together, if we can tap into the best of our respective traditions, the best of our respective, respective religious teachings and moral and ethical teachings, we will move forward and we will create a better tomorrow and we will be a source of hope for each other and not a source of dread and apprehension. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.